Well, my reading, since when did you start caring about poetry, Joe? <laughs> okay. I'm reading a guy named Sam Gwynn, R.S. Gwynn, Formalist Guy. Oh, well, he's going to be heartbroken that you haven't heard of him, Joe. Uh, let's not tell him that. But the thing is, I, I got to do an apology. No, not to you. I'm not apologizing to you. I have to apologize to everybody out there. I mean, to the world, basically, to Donald Ravel, to my following of 43 people. Um, it's, it's about this it's phenomenological Phenomenological. Yeah, you got it. I I, I messed up. I I, I I ran down this word. I feel really bad about it. And and we're doing dread. Okay, dread. <laughs> okay, you're just trying to get me to meet you at the Donut Inn. Or the House of Pies. Yes, uh, the House of Pies. Not, no, not yet. It's too soon, too soon to meet you again, Joe, at the House of Pies. He's still there, still waiting, still waiting for me to change my mind about the House of Pies. This guy, he's never heard of R.S. Gwynn. And you know what he said to me? I mean, he's just trying to sweet talk me, you know. And he says, you're the only poet I need to know. It's, that's how women like me get into trouble. Anyway, we're doing dread today. But first, my retraction. Now, I'm the kind of person that when I make a mistake, I just say it straight out. I made a mistake. I am an idiot, okay? And then we move on from that. So you remember last time I was running down all these words used by a noted feminist critic, Marianne Doan, and one of the words I ran down, I treated it like it was two for a dime? Phenomenological. Now, I don't know what kind of argument I had with this word. But as soon as I ran it down and treated it like it was two for a dime, I go home and on my email, there is a copy of an anthology coming out with me in it by Daniel Lawless, edited by the great and much beloved Daniel Lawless. And it's called Plume Seven. There was a plume one, two, three, four, five, six, and now there's a plume seven with notable, successful, and very interesting poets from all around the country. And the man who did the introduction to this Plume 7, his name is Donald Ravel. Donald Ravel writes in free verse, writes in form, won a Penn Center USA Award, has translated a Polonaire, and has an anthology of literary criticism. Oh, he's written, he's written 12 books, 12 books, of poetry, literary criticism, and translations. Donald Ravel, right? Good, good man, good poet. And he singles me out. He singles out my poem in the introduction. And out of these 60, 70 poets, there's only four, maybe five people he singles out. And you know what he says? about my poem. Are you ready for this? Suzanne Lummis's poem is one of the anguished, all know what he says, it is one of the urgent 
almost anguished phenomenological pleasures in this anthology. You hear what I'm telling you? What a beautiful word, phenomenological. It just dances off the tongue. It's musical. Whoever invented that word, good for you. Dread. We're doing dread. It's the poem I have by Sam Gwynn. It is infused with a sense of dread. So I started thinking, what noir films have the sense of dread, are, are most invested with a sense of dread? And the first thing that came to my mind was a movie that came out in 1948, directed by Anthony Mann, lit by John Alton, one of the masters, one of the most acclaimed cinematographers, an innovator in the art, right? And it was called He Walks by Night. It's a police procedure. It's slow. Uh, you know, you might kind of skip to the end, unless you're really interested in how the police investigated crimes the the around 1948 or so. Watts in Wilshire and West Los Angeles. Hollywood and Hollenbeck Heights in North Hollywood. The work of the police, like that of woman, is never done. This is the case history of a killer, taken from the files of the detective division. The facts are told here as they happen. The killer, he's a man who was a policeman himself. So he knows how law enforcement works. That's why he's able to stay. He's a killer, right? I've got to see some identification. How about my army discharge? I got it right here. He's able to stay a step ahead of the police all the way along because he knows their methods. He knows what they're going to do next. Five to 165 pounds. Brown hair. Regular features. Pencil mustache. This was no frightened fugitive. What went on in his mind? Why had he set his hand against his fellow men? It would baffle the police. They always expected burglars to remain burglars, not go in for stick-ups. They'd never tie this up with him. So wearing a variety of disguises, coming and going like a shadow, ready to kill if cornered, he struck the bottle stores in a one-man blitz that had the robbery detail dizzy. <laughs> At the end, they finally trap him, and they trap him in the sewers under the city, the gutters, the tunnels, and there you get this gorgeous chasing by foot, and the shadows are on the wall, and he's running, and law enforcement closing in on him, trapping him, and I thought, well, that's one way to think about dread. But in this case, he knows what's chasing him. What will happen when he's caught? What he did to get him into this situation? It's frightening, but it's more terror than it is what I call dread. So although that represents tremendous fear, a man who realizes he's probably breathing his last breath, I think dread is the fear of something you don't know. You don't even know what it is. You don't even know what you're afraid of. That's existential fear, existential dread. And the greatest depiction of that, oh, we have to keep going back and back. Every time, we have to keep circling back to double indemnity because nobody did it better. Billy Wilder, Raymond Chandler worked on it together. Raymond Chandler knew how to write. I mean, he could write dialogue like nobody's business. Billy Wilder, he would have been teaching Chandler the mechanics of how to construct a script 
technically, and also how to tell a story visually, not just with words. But when you hear that great snapping, witty dialogue and double indemnity, it's good today as it was in 1944, that's got to be the hand of Raymond Chandler. So Walter Neff, he's completed the murder of the husband of the woman, his paramour, that he would like to run away with. They've murdered the guy together, left him on the railroad tracks. And Walter Neff, played by Fred McMurray, is leaving the scene, and he says, That was all there was to it. Nothing had slipped. Nothing had been overlooked. There was nothing to give us away. And yet, Keys, as I was walking down the street to the drugstore, suddenly it came over me that everything would go wrong. It sounds crazy, Keys, but it's true, so help me. I couldn't hear my own footsteps. It was the walk of a dead man. That, my friends, my fellow noir aficionados, my poetry lovers, that is dread, a thing that comes over you like a terrible truth. So that's what Sam Gwynn, also known as R.S. Gwynn, that's what he was writing about. I have to open my mysterious, does this door look mysterious to you? It's not really that mysterious, but it contains mysterious scenes. So, R.S. Gwynn, he was, he's a formalist. Um, he's also a literary critic. He was, among many other anthologies that he's been collected in, he was in a groundbreaking anthology called Rebel Angels, 25 Formalist Poets. He has written and collected, edited anthologies on form, um, written numerous books of poetry, been teaching in Texas as a professor, for many years, his formalist poems have a wit and they're acerbic. So when you think of poetry and form and rhyme, if you're thinking, how do I love thee, let me count the ways, or I wandered lonely as a cloud, get all that out of your head. No. We are not in the 19th century anymore. Nobody wanders lonely as a cloud anymore. He's writing with the sensibilities of our age and in the language of our age. But in skillful rhyme, and this poem, it looks like this. So you can see it's a sonnet, right? You can tell, yeah, it's probably going to run around 14 lines, and this one rhymes, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, the octave, the first eight lines, right? And then you get to the sestet, the next six lines, and then this rhyme scheme changes. So we ended with B, right? We had A, B, A, B, all of that. Then you go C, and then it becomes different. Then it goes C. It goes D, D. E, E, and then back to C. So you're going to, at the end, at the beginning of the sestet, you're going to, it's going to end with who, and then the end of the sonnet is going to be you. So the little tricky, sometimes poets invent their own sonnet schemes. They can if they want to, because, hey, who's going to stop them? You know, not me. Anyway. It is called The Great Fear. Here where the door stands open, lights are on. Each object 
occupies a special place. Note the half sheet of fool's cap by the phone where numbers someone labored to erase have left impressions, and there's no dial tone. The TV glows, turn down. Dark figures chase one who must learn no mercy can be shown in such an extraordinary case. An individual was here, but who? His sheets are cold, the paper back Romance gapes open dog-eared while his hanging pants and belt await him. There is nothing missing, not any sound, except the kettle hissing, ready for the next one, whose name is you. What's that about? Someone in dread of himself. Someone who has a sense that a presence has occupied this room while he wasn't there. Your interpretation is as good as mine. Meanwhile, here we are, January 29th. 2019. Oh, we are so rich, so rich in dread in the age that we're living in. We can just choose what we would like to be in dread of. I think I would like to be in dread of the possibility that Psycho Man in Washington, D.C. might shut down the government again. That'll work for me. You can all find your own personal dread, I'm sure. Just look around. (laughs) Good night, ladies. Good night, gentlemen. And remember, look both ways, watch your back, and don't let anybody treat you like you're two for dying. Thank you.